Since you all know how to read, I think that we will now turn to the beginning, saying that if you get bored during the lecture, <laughs> you can look into the books. They are put here after the uh, lecture. The books will get into your hands and will become part of the library. I have a couple of small flyers here that describe this my book. Those of you who really are interested in looking for more, pick up one. Otherwise, keep in mind that we are all trying to save nature and the environment, and I honestly believe in that. Uh, <coughs> there is also available for those interested the introduction to the most recent issue of the International Journal of General Systems. It's an issue that I edited on the subject of anticipation. And for some very interesting reasons, we never know what we do in our life, and after that we are surprised, as I was today when we did the introduction. I was trying to think, is he talking about me? And yes, he was talking about me. But it's interesting to find out how others see what you do. And there's always a distance, you know. You probably remember going to a photographer and taking your picture, and then you look at, at the picture and say, it doesn't look like me. OK, I, I don't tell you anything that you don't know. Again, those of you who are interested, give it a look. But the interesting part that I want to mention to you is, many years ago, Peter Nucket is the culprit, invited me to Raymond. And all of a sudden, somebody with the name of Mexner invites me to a place called Delman Horse. I never knew that there was Delman Horse. I never knew there was a Hatze Institute. And I'm landing here, and there's something for anticipation. And I'm totally shocked because I looked at all these guys coming from psychology, and they have a, had a very strange understanding of anticipation. So I, I had the feeling. I'm talking to people speaking in a foreign language in relation to what I thought anticipation is. Some years later, I'm editing this uh, issue of the International Journal. And obviously, I credit the Hanse Wirtschafts colleague, because that was the meeting that I participated. I met Mexico, not only him. And after years, it came to this issue. So I feel very comfortable in identifying the publication also with the activity of the house. Which gives me the occasion to say to everyone in the house with whom I interacted, but I mean everyone, even those who are not here. Uh, the ladies from the reception and the house master. It's a wonderful place. And they all deserve our respect, they definitely have my respect. I'm, I'm honestly talking about everyone in this house, and if you want to do me a favor whenever you have an internal meeting, tell them that I have the deepest respect for the way they treated myself and my colleagues until now. I also want to say my thank you to Otan Herzog and to Professor Frexa. Uh, I don't like to embarrass friends. Friends. That's why I keep usually the thank you short so that it doesn't go into the embarrassing. I'm very honest about it and I feel it. But it's sometimes better not to add too much because then comes the suspicion, did he really mean it? And I honestly mean the things that I say. You are going to see it also in my lecture today. I also want to say thank you to some of you sitting here, and I'm going to refer to some of you every now and then. Tavarish Suhotin was a great inspiration when he gave his lecture uh, on the metabolism, and boy, all of a sudden, he opened another horizon in respect to participation. And then I was at some wonderful seminars organized here, and I met people who are doing fascinating work. Our French representative inspired me a lot with his own work on sensors. Uh, our colleague, uh, Ms. Kim, not only gave me the chance to tell her two, three words in Korean, as I learned them some years ago, but she brought back some of the very inspiring moments of the research and anticipation that relate to music. 
And by the way, since Senor Lombard is here and I had the occasion to look at his music in my little place on the second floor, because that's where they have your music all the time, I will start with the notion that probably all music is in itself anticipatory. And for those who come from the music, you are going to say, okay, big deal, we knew that. Uh, they knew that this, this notion of il filo, you start at the end in your process of composing, and then in, the whole thing starts getting mixed, and nobody will see where you started. But the il filo is a very, very powerful moment, and my chance was, this house hosted a beautiful conference on Enescu and Bartok, and I met a sensational intellectual Tibor Sass, the pianist who gave us his concert. And then I stayed in touch with Tibor Sass because Tibor Sass got me close to Enescu's interest in anticipation, Enescu discovering that behind the Romanian motives that inspired him, there was Arabic music, and there was Slavic music, and there were so many other il filo, you know, all the, 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 the sons and daughters that we all have, and sometimes we acknowledge and sometimes we don't. So having said that, keep in mind that when you talk about anticipation, you are talking about a symphonic orchestra in which none of the players is reacting to the other player. Because if they would react, you would run out from the concert. In other words, when your turn comes with your violin, or, or with your fagot, or with your oboe, you don't go in in reaction to the other instrument. You are practically anticipating your place in that. That's the human being. If you did not think about the human being as this fabulous orchestra, which sometimes doesn't sound good. I went through a moment when I looked at myself and I said, boy, <laughs> something is not really in order with the conductor here. You know, what do we do? <laughs> but these are my ways to give you an analogy and no more. If you, however, look at the skies here in Delmenhorst and see swarms of birds, those swarms could not exist without those birds being or expressing anticipation. Yeah? You would see on the floor here, down, dead birds. They never collide. There is a lot of anticipation that happens there in a situation in which thousands of participants are involved. And there is no conductor to that orchestra of the birds flying. Okay? Or the swarms in the oceans, because there is a lot of research going here that has to do with oceans. So I'm trying to introduce to you a little the notion of anticipation by way of trying to make you aware that it's around us. We are an expression of anticipation. Only at the moment when our anticipation breaks down do we notice that there is anticipation, and then we notice it because it was not there when we take it for granted. And that is one of the ways in which I arrived at some of my observations, because my first project at the University of Dallas in Texas was a project that I called Sene Ludens. Sene coming from the word senescence, getting old, and Ludens playing. George Bernard Shaw <coughs> makes the observation that we get old because, because we are no longer able or willing to play. It's a powerful observation, and you can say it's a metaphor. Look at some of the <coughs> old people who gave up playing, and you realize that's the last phase. So if you can, don't give up playing. We might meet in 20, 30, 40 years, and you are going to come back to me and say, boy, I kind of got an idea from you. Why was I looking at senescence and playing? Because the university is building a huge program in computer games. Computer games are for me not, you know, shoot, shoot them all and do all the good things that people are doing day and night, someone being even addicted to them. They are a way of engaging others. 
So I asked the question, maybe we can engage those who are getting old and are no longer willing, interested, or stimulated to play. So that was the project in the And I learned from around 97 subjects that we had in the lab, <coughs> what happens when anticipation is, starts fading us. So, <coughs> I decided to organize my presentation to you this evening in two parts. First, to introduce a little and very softly the notion of anticipation so that we are all on the same page. And then second, I will try to get your attention on the notion of how do we create an experimental environment in which we don't only become aware of anticipation, but start trying to quantify it, start trying to describe it in some form, so that we can do something with the knowledge corresponding to anticipation. Okay? That's my plan. Whether I'm going to be able to keep up to the plan, I don't know. At this moment, I understand that the technology is there. I will show you a very, very short animation, very, very short, and I will give credit, yeah, I will give credit to Robert Fuentes, who is one of my doctoral candidates, and who last night was able to generate, so this is very hot data, the whole thing is not yet even in the shape in which I would like to have it. And this image here relates to the example that started me on anticipation here at Hanse. There was a guy from Switzerland who was referring to Leonardo da Vinci's observation, which means 500 years ago, that as I stand in front of you, my center of gravity is in the middle, no problem with my balance, okay? I get my arms up, the center of gravity is here, why didn't I fall? And Leonardo da Vinci makes this observation 500 years ago, and if you want to give yourself a gift, next time you look at representations of the human being in Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, look at how he captures the expression in the muscles of the body corresponding to the position of the bodies that he's painting. In other words, he doesn't only make the observation as a theory, he transforms it into a means of expression. What happens actually? At the moment when I raise my hands, something happened in my body before. It is as though my body knew that I'm going to raise my hands. Knowing in advance. Knowing in advance means there is some compensation in the muscles here in my legs that allow me to maintain the balance. Older people don't have this capacity anymore. Some of them, you're going to see, would even avoid when they wake, when they walk on the street, to move their arms. Because moving their arms means changing center of gravity. So they will walk with the arms very close to the body. It's one of those symptoms that will tell you that person starts having problems with the balance. Okay? Have you said that? What you see here it is a very simple animation that allowed us to look exactly at the example that I gave you. And here you have the various muscles <coughs> and how they get engaged once the movement starts. The interesting thing for anticipation is the onset. Those things that happen before the arms go up. And you can see very clearly here that at the onset, we have a very interesting activity taking place on both sides. When the arms are up, no longer a big deal. We know what happens. The body found its uh, uh, balance. When the arms are getting down, the energy that was used in creating the first condition for the balance has now to be dissipated. And that's why you see the signals in the activity of the muscles, okay? I gave you this image and I repeat. Robert Fuentes last evening, based on some of the measurements we did in the lab, 
Uh, after we had 97 sub such subjects, we accumulated a huge amount of data. And we said, oh, we are now happy. Let the party start. And then we discovered that's not so easy. It's not so easy because what do you do with that huge amount of data? First of all, do you understand what it means? And number two, assuming that you understand what it means, how are you going to do an aggregate of that data? Accordingly, now comes the promise that I made to you, that I will give you a little introduction to what anticipation is, and I will start with one of my favorite writers. If you never read for his, you punish yourself, and this is the time to change this in your life. Uh, go and really discover the good things of life. One is going to be Borges. In one of his stories, when he talks about the exactitude in science, our obsession. Yeah? As scientists, we want to be as exact as possible. He makes the observation that the best map is the map that has the size of the empire. And then the story ends with this very sad realization. But it's good for nothing. What do you do with it? Yeah? And so some people start dying under that map. Now, you are going to hear from me today actually a lecture about maps in the end. And you are going to find out soon what I mean by that. Let's start with a little of what is anticipation. As opposed to what you studied in school, where there is a cause that, uh, yes, that affects the state of a system, and we call this determinism. In other words, you take the hammer and you hit here the nail, and you know exactly what's going to happen. Correct? That's what we learn in school. Things start getting a little easier if we are no longer talking about cause and effect, but multi-causes. Because most of the time, the phenomena that we are encountering don't have one cause. They have many causes. For reasons of convenience, we focus on one. It's easier. That's called the deterministic way of dealing with that. From everything that is around, you cut a piece and you look at one cause and that's what it is. But here comes the very interesting experiment done by the Karolinska, which means our colleagues in Sweden. They made the observation that if I give you a hammer in your hand, and if I put you in front of a wall and there is a nail there, your hand will adapt to the task. In other words, it is as though the hand knows how hard the task is. It will not hold the hammer tighter or weaker than what the task asks. Only if your anticipation is not in order, and that happens to children. Give them a hammer and you are going to see they try it, and the hammer flies. Do it to an older person. You give them the hammer. And poor people, they complain. Most of the time the hammer flies because they don't get this automatic gift of the anticipation of adapting to the task. Okay? Now, here we are. Anticipation is, obviously, laws of physics are 100% respected. I mean, don't hear from me any time that I'm contradicting the laws of physics. We have to have this understanding. Determinism stands. But in addition to it, there is a future, which is the task of nailing, that returns a value to my action. So, it is not only the past that influences my action, but also the possible future. That is the reason why you hear from me that anticipation is a realization in the realm of possibilities. Having said that, here's the more or less formal description 
of an anticipatory system. <coughs> an anticipatory system is a system whose we are going to play technology, state, current state depends on a previous state, which means t minus alpha. Minus alpha can be one millisecond, can be 100 milliseconds, I don't want to get into uh, these uh, details now. The current state and the future state. This is the formal description of an anticipatory system. And here we have examples. If you think that you are going to be a good professional tennis player and you are going to return a tennis serve at 100, 120 kilometers an hour by reacting to it, change the profession, <laughs> you will never see that. Okay? If you think that you are going to be one of those champions that you see on TV coming downhill, again, 100, 120 kilometers an hour, and sometimes even faster, and you are going to react to something and save your life. Save your life, don't get on the skis. <laughs> it's the anticipation that allows those who are performing the way they perform to be able to avoid situations. Here's a very interesting situation, which I analyzed a hundred times, I got in touch with very, very many people, it's in respect to a tsunami that scared the hell out of everyone. Read, look at the images and say, wait a second, are those animals smarter than we? How come did the human beings at the tsunami go to the beach and play soccer? They will never play again, as you probably realize. And the animals went to the hill. What are those processes that we are probably not even aware of that took care and inform their expression. I will give you an example of something that happens to you day in, day out, if you are healthy. I repeat, if you are healthy. Day in, day out, you and me are a cylinder. And the pressure of the liquid, which is your blood, in the cylinder is easy to calculate. The pressure in the cylinder changes when you go to sleep. You know physics. Even those who are artists studied physics at least for a while. So you know that the pressure in this liquid here changes at the moment when I change the position because of the geometry. Okay? If this is the case, every time you would go to sleep and every time you would come out from your bed, you're going to feel dizzy because your blood pressure will go up and down. It turns out that it doesn't. Why doesn't it? Because before you change your position, the heart changes its rhythm. In other words, you get a different heartbeat. So the heartbeat, faster or slower, is compensating for the geometry that changes. It does not for those who have a problem. Again, the same example. And if you happen to live in Munich, you know what happens during fun time. Some people say, I don't know anything, you know, it's fine. Other people say, Phew. yeah, that's anticipation at work. My classic example, Professor Anter, sorry, I have to repeat that, I mentioned it to him last evening, uh, the landing of the cat, and, you know, if you love your cat, don't do it, but you know that the cat will usually land the right way. I'm here at the fundamental moment, and after that, in a short time, we are going to be at the anticipation scope, I promise. <coughs> you probably all know, those who study physics, my good colleague is an example, and those who didn't study physics, that the ambition of physics is to say our subject of research is nature. Newton said it, our subject is nature. And I agree with him. I honestly agree with him. He was a universalist. He did not look only at stones. He looked at many other things. He even entertained the notion of whether there is a God or not. So you realize what nature meant at that time at Newton time. What I'm saying that the dynamics of the living and the dynamics of the non-living in nature are not the same. In order to explain it, and not to make it so complicated, I'm presenting you with a very simple image. 
as you see, this image is introducing to you the notion of time scale. The aging of this face is at least metaphorically not different from the aging of this piece of stone. Only it just happens that the aging of this face is a issue that we associate with a scale of 40, 50, 60 years. And here we associate with a scale of some millions of years. The same thing happens in respect to here, nature in the mountains. The dynamics of the change of the mountains is a little different than the dynamics of the change in the forests in those mountains. My first attempt was based on Robert Rosen, and if you paid attention to my first slide, when I said to you, why have things out, etc., I announced to you that in these days, the second edition of Robert Rosen's book on anticipatory systems is going to be issued by Springer Verlag. Uh, I feel more than honored, I feel lucky, because I am the guy who is alive. I feel lucky that I could write a prolegomena to the second edition. If you are interested in his book, and I suggest you should be, if anticipation will tickle you in some ways, uh, don't worry about reading my prolegomena, worry about reading his book. It was, in its own ways, a prophetic book. And I'm always touched to remember a person with whom I would prefer to be this evening. And we could together talk about things that are of interest to us. I have the chance of being able to announce to you the second edition. What does this uh, model say? This model says that if we look at nature, and if we took a systems approach, you could take some other approaches, but a systems approach is indi indicated for this, then in order to deal with an the anticipation of the system, I have to conceive of a model that unfolds in faster than real time. And at this moment comes my first observation to you. I hope that nobody in this room considers time being the same thing to what you see on your watch. What you see on your watch, or what your watch is, is an instrument that measures intervals. Watches, clocks don't measure time. Time is a different animal. Time can be of different scales. Not all the time happens to be equally slow or equally fast. You yourself, I'm very sure, went through moments when you slipped on something and you realized how fast all of a sudden things are. And you went through other times when you said, boy, the lecture is so boring, how long is it going to take? Yeah? You went through such moments. So when we talk about time, we talk about something tremendously uh, uh, interesting because it has so many uh, facets to it. Now if we talk an anticipatory system, we would like them to have some effectors that will allow us to influence the natural system that we are modeling. On this note, I would suggest to you that we are all involved in describing natural systems such as nature around Avita. Yeah? How do we do it? We do it in two ways. We use a formal system, for instance, mathematics. I showed you the equations before. And then we talk, take those equations and start operating on them. <coughs> With the assumption that operating on an equation is like operating on nature. That's always our assumption. In other words, if you take the equation of gravity and you say, I'm able to affect gravity, it's like saying, I'm able to play God, Newton, whoever you want. Yeah? On the other hand, what I try to make you aware is we are always aware that everything that happens is causal. In other words, anticipation does not introduce a non-causal explanation of the world. Having said that, And that's the hypothesis that, that I'm working very hard at for a long time. I make the distinction, the distinction between the living and the non-living. Now, if you probably remember, around the 18th, 19th century, 
science came with this tremendous statement, boy, we're in trouble because of Aristoteles. We're in trouble because of the so-called <coughs> animistic philosophy. How in the world can somebody come and say that there is something that has an anima, in other words, is living, while stones don't? I'm not trying to reinvent animism, and I'm not trying to come with a new formulation of animism. I'm trying to introduce a rational foundation for distinguishing between the living and the non-living. And for this distinction, I'm using, and I confess to you, yes, I'm using, that's what scientists do, they look at what other scientists did, and they try to build upon, so they're using. I'm using the work of probably one of the most interesting scientists ever, who happens to be Kurt Gürl. If you never heard about him, you probably realize everybody can live without having heard about Gödel. If you heard about him, you will soon understand why I say that. The non-living, such as a stone, is a complicated system. This computer is a complicated system. This whole building is a complicated system. Complexity, even if it is the complexity of one cell, is a different thing from the complication of the rest of the world. Now, what is the threshold of complexity? I offer you a very short description of Gödel's theorem, but for those of you who do not want to, you know, get their brains too tired, here is, in short, what more or less we learn from Gödel. There are some things, some entities, that we can describe in a manner that is complete. There are some other entities that we can describe in a manner that if it is complete, it's not going to be consistent. In other words, it's going to be contradictory. I'm claiming that the threshold for the living is the, the place at which our descriptions will either be complete and not consistent, or they will be consistent but not complete. So if you realize that the living is like, it's a slippery entity. You think you have it all in your hands, but actually it slipped already from your hands. Now those who come from quantum mechanics, and there are some colleagues here, will have their own thoughts about other ways to deal with defining this uh, 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 threshold. What I'm going to show, and from here we'll go directly, I know I still have 10 minutes, I will go directly to the scope. What I'm going to show to you is, <coughs> anticipation is characteristic of the complex system. As such, we will never be able to reproduce it in experiments. As you know, the foundation of science is the experiment that can be reproduced. In anticipation, there are things that simply cannot be reproduced. Don't ask me to take the animals after the tsunami, produce another tsunami and see how that will happen. The behavior is not going to be automatically the same. The same thing happens to your health. <coughs> If your immune system worked a hundred times and a million times, it doesn't mean that at the million one it will work also. So as opposed to a deterministic system in which you have a consistent cause and effect, in anticipation you are in the non-deterministic domain in which, in which anticipation might fail you. Those of you who ever in your life looking at you, seeing how young you are, probably none of you experience being sick, would know that that's one of those examples in which we have a failure. <coughs> my experiment with the stone and the cat, and my favorite scientist who is totally forgotten today, Windelband. We introduce the distinction between the nomothetic, which means expressions through laws of science, and here you have 
Sorry, I jumped. I don't know why I did it, but I didn't control myself. Okay, here you have the law of gravity. And there are other people going to tell you, you know, in my lab, I try to do it. And the value that is guaranteed through Newton's, in which you do not have wind, etc. So all the factors that affect, in reality, the falling of, of something. And the difference is quite big. Now, the limits of the nomothetic. Here is the best of mathematics that I was able to find in describing the falling of a cat. Now, in describing the falling of a stone, you can look at it and it's a very, very elegant equation. This is far from being elegant. I would even say you always need in science a moment when you can laugh because if you start considering your cat as being made of two cylinders <laughs> and, you know, the cat, even if the cat would know it, it would still not fall the way our mathematical description, which is an abstraction, does it. And that's the moment when Dindelman introduces the notion of the ideographic. Things we cannot describe in law, but rather in history, in descriptions, in gestalt, his use of the word gestalt, Friedrich Bakke knows it because uh, he helped me a lot in looking at from the original text to some uh, uh, English variation. So knowledge is an expression. <laughs> this is uh, for you politics, you don't need it. If you ever apply for a grant, you need a statement like this in order to convince, you know, to expect money from you to give you the money. <laughs> And now it gets serious because this is the reason why I'm here. And you see, I'm again saying my thank you to those I collaborate. Peter Kuning is not here, but I owe it to one of his <coughs> students, an Estonian student called Kurtzma, to have discovered during my stay here in uh, Delmenhorst that boy, I thought that Rosen and I invented anticipation. Wrong. There were many others who tried. I talked to Gdzie Suhotina. I talked to Suhotin's wife yesterday, and she knows. Nobody else probably in this room now knows. There's a guy called Nikolai Bernstein. Stalin put him even in jail in the Soviet Union. Who had in the 40s two books on the motoric elements of the human body. And even though he does not use specifically the notion, he's advancing notion of anticipation. So it's, it's an incredible thing. And you look back and you say, boy, how ignorant can I be? OK, now I have my task to read the books in Russian that uh, you know, uh, uh, Bernstein uh, uh, produced. But I, I owe it to one of the students from Peter Krenin, and when I went to Osnabrück, it was a very good visit. What is the anticipation scope? The parallel is to the microscope. And I am here, obviously, <coughs> pertinent, because I cannot claim the glory of those who invented the uh, microscope that changed all our understanding of medicine and of many other things. I hope that the anticipation scope will also change our understanding of some phenomena that pertain to the living. And here we have Borges and maps. Doctors, and not only doctors, used maps before. One of the maps was the neural profile. If you go to your neurologist today, he will try to define your neural profile in order to find out what's going on with you. Why don't you sleep? Why are you nervous? Things like that. If you go to your cardiologist, he will try to define for you the cardiovascular profile. We'll measure heart and heartbeat and things like that. There are others who will look for your hormonal profile. And there are some people who are very good at it and make a good living and at the same time help people who have problems. And there are others who deal with the motor dynamics profile, which are also doing sometimes a, a beautiful uh, work. The anticipatory profile would be the impossible map that Bohr has talked about. 
trying to create a map that is as big as the human body, but in this case, not big, not size counts, but the element, the, the variables. Here's what we do. We have a so-called motion capture lab. Is there anyone here who does not know what motion capture is? So everybody knows. So motion capture <coughs> is a huge environment in which many cameras allow you to get a description of whatever a person does. I move through this room and having some uh, sensors on me, the motion capture produces a description of all my movements. And it says, at which moment in time did I move my hand? At which moment in time did I move my head? In other words, it gives me a record. It's, it's almost a film of what the person does, but the film that comes together with data. It tells me how the toe participated in my movement. It tells me whether the ear will participate. In other words, it does more than only the film, because it starts extracting some data. So I'm taking this motion capture, I'm combining it with the eye track moving, and I'm combining it further with physiological sensors that capture the functioning of the muscles, that tell me how the heartbeat goes, and tells me as much as possible. The scientific problem is I'm getting lots of data, and I have to deal with data streams and motion capture that references what I'm doing. Then I have to do data fusion, and I have to do data interpretation. Sounds easier than done. Look at it on a slide that you will not love because it's not very sexy. <laughs> but this is where reality starts. This is where you get dirty, you know, the digging. And you realize, boy, how in the world are you going to do an aggregate of things that are measured in microvolts? So we're talking electricity. They're talking in, in micro Siemens, total different world that are talking in percentages, that are talking in bits per minute. The data types for those who come from computer science are extremely different, and you cannot reduce them to each other. When you start doing then the feature extraction of these very complicated things, and when you try then to do the clustering in order to do something meaningful with them, you realize how complicated the problem is. So, that's the reason I'm here, to find out if this can be done, if this big Borges map can be obtained. You're going to see here simply uh, documented how we do it with the trigger modules, with, with our cameras, and you're going to see here an example of preliminary data. You take the tibia, and then you take the data, and you get rid of the symmetric part because you don't need it, there is nothing new in it, things like that. I, I don't want to get you into the uh, uh, really details of how, how, how deep you get into the processing of data. But I, what I want you to understand is I'm all the time interested in what happens before the action. <coughs> if the action is supposed to be a jump, yeah? As simple as a jump. I'm interested in what happens before the jump. This is where I can find anticipation. If there is any. And I don't want to start with notions that there is going to be. Again, a little of a, a more technical part that some of you might like more than the others. And those of you who like it and need it, talk to me after, because I want to be fair to everyone and to start explaining all these vectors and whatever will go a little too uh, far. Uh, we did <coughs> the motion capture and the EMG integration that works. That's what the first slide that I showed you with Robert Fuentes showed. But when you start getting more of your data, you start having a little problems with the feature extraction. Now, this is the major hypothesis of the whole project. We are not born with anticipation. I still have one minute. Hmm. I'm going to ask you for five more, if you don't mind. If you are very hungry, I can cut it even here. <laughs> okay. My major hypothesis is we are not born with anticipation. 
Look at babies who have no sense of balance. They are learning it. Same thing, we are not going to die with anticipation. We will return to the physicality of what we are, and that anticipation will no longer be there. Here is where you are, you're a good tennis player, and you're a good ski guy, and if you are involved in boxing or whatever. Here is what I would hope we can do to extend the part of human's life during which anticipation is present. So that you don't start hating the fact that you are still alive. Because there are moments in which you might get to hating the fact that you are alive. And I will give you an example, probably one of the last today. Have you ever thought about the fact that to sit down movement, what does it mean? Take 150 pounds, okay, 75 kilograms, and instead of sitting them down the way I sat down, drop them on the chair. You will soon have no chairs in your house. <laughs> okay? So what does anticipation do? Anticipation, it gives you a soft landing. I'm not affirming it. I'm not saying that your back part sees the chair. <laughs> because if you go into that direction, you go into the wrong direction. If you go into the direction, oh no, the mind starts calculating and the computer in your brain does it and knows exactly. No, it doesn't. <coughs> it is a learning process. It's based on patterns. And that's why patterns are here very important. I gave you the example of sitting. There are people who, when they get old, they prefer not to get off from their chair because to sit again is going to be painful. They don't have the anticipatory soft landing, and they get hurt. Just to give you an example of what it means and how one needs to understand. And as I promised, we're getting to the very end. Oops, even the machine tells me that we're getting to the end. Well, anyone understands why? No, doesn't it? I like technology because it is uh, incredible. <laughs> but if that, it doesn't want it, it doesn't like it. We try to work with people involved in med medicine to see how the loss of anticipation leads to post-traumatic stress disorder, to Parkinson's disease. Some of you walking here the street down probably noticed the gentleman who lives in one of the buildings here, a Parkinson gentleman. It's an amazing experience to have to look at what it means to live with a condition in which some of your anticipation is gone. Yeah? We had in uh, the place in our lab a uh, guy from the University of Texas uh, uh, in the, the, the medical school who is an expert in Parkinson. And the conclusion was, in the anticipation scope, we could, in principle, identify Parkinson six years before it becomes symptomatic. Because it becomes symptomatic six years after the onset. So we could pick it up six years in advance. Whew. It's one of those things in which you say, do I really want to do it? Because imagine you come in my lab, and I look at you, do I play with you what? God or what? You know, I know something that if you know it's going to be bad, if you don't know it's not going to be better, think about it. I let you think about it. There is a skewed anticipation in the autistic behavior. The image that you see here is an image that tells you how autistic behavior is expressed. Yeah? You get in the information or you start blocking the information. There is a component of anticipation in Alzheimer's. What else can we do? Yes, we can find out who from those who would like to be tennis players or who would like to uh, play the violin. By the way, here in this house, a teacher of violin called Bieden Berger from Switzerland made the following observation. He is not teaching Suzuki method, don't anyone here who learned based on the Suzuki method 
Okay. So he's not teaching Suzuki method, which is the mechanical perfect movement. He's teaching based on anticipation, which means what? You need to learn how to get the sound that you want to hear. In other words, you do the movement in anticipation of what you want to hear. Not the mechanics. If you move it like this, that sound will come out. That's the machine. The anticipation based is the one in which you expect a sound. And you do the movement until you match that sound. And since we have here in house really a great photographer, because he is one of the great photographers, probably you know it and you don't hear anything new from me. Uh, now, people who think that they are great photographers only because they have a camera, go to the house and you're going to find out what it would take, what kind of anticipation it would take you to create one of the pictures from among those that are hanging in this house. So even in an activity that seems to be trivial, taking pictures, we can all do it. But don't expect all of you to be such good photographers as the gentleman who gives us the chance to, hear, to see his work in the house. This was the project Sinaludens. This is something that I don't want to talk anymore. These are the various types of information that we want to involve in order to create that Borgesian map. And I will tell you only one thing about one part of it, which is this, tympanic temperature. Given the fact that anticipation is always expressed in action, we said you cannot do MRI somebody in a lab walking or sitting on a chair. How can you get some information about the brain? And one of the person I worked work with, Dr. Desu, said, what about tympanic temperature? Which means a thermometer that picks up the temperature a little deeper in your ear. And we learned the following thing. It's a very simple experiment. Probably you made it in your life. You can do your balance like this. Am I right? Once you start closing your eyes, it's a little more difficult to do the balance because some of the information is not there. It starts being cognitively more complicated. Guess what? If you try to do this exercise with the tympanic temperature, you will find out that once you close the eyes, the temperature will go higher. Why? The brain is trying to compensate for the missing information once you close your eyes. That, that was a tremendous piece of information. How do you integrate it in the cortex and back? I have no idea, and since I don't have an idea, my motto in life as a scientist is impossible takes a little longer. I would like to be able to create a wearable anticipation score. You put it on, you play tennis, you play football, you uh, hug your wife, you, whatever. Yeah? And you have a very interesting record of who you are and how you are. Do you want to have it? Remember what happened in the Borgesian map. And if you don't want to have it, at least I presented to you the possibility. And if I have enough support, thank you for the Hanze Business colleague, one day I might be able to start working even at this part of the project, which is the impossible part. Thank you for your time and attention. And I hope you are going to enjoy a dinner that's going to be better than whatever. <laughs> <laughs>